Well, hello YouTube. Um, continuing the series on metaethics, uh, the first view that I'm going to look at is emotivism. Um, now, emotivism was first proposed by A.J. Ayer in his book Language, Truth and Logic. Um, you might remember that emotivism is a form of non-cognitivism. So, emotivists say that moral statements do not express beliefs, and as such they cannot be true or false. Uh, now, in order to explain emotivism, we need to take a bit of a detour, because Ayer was a major figure in the logical positivist movement, and emotivism er really arose out of logical positivist ideas. Um, so, uh, logical positivism uh, flourished around the early to mid-1900s, and its adherents were uh, aggressively scientistic. They were very impressed with the major developments in science, mathematics and logic, uh, and they felt that philosophy hadn't kept up with these developments. They felt that many of the traditional philosophical debates were just a waste of time. So they wanted to make radical reforms to philosophy. Uh, and the way they enacted this was through a theory of meaning known as verificationism, which is summed up in the verification principle. And this says that a statement is meaningful if and only if it is either analytic or empirically verifiable. Otherwise it's meaningless. Right, so what does this mean? Uh, well, first, uh, there's a distinction between analytic and synthetic statements. An analytic statement is one that's true solely in virtue of its meaning. Uh, a synthetic statement is one that's true in virtue of the way the world is. If I say, it is raining, in order to tell whether this is true or false, we have to examine the world, say, by looking out a window. Uh, so um, this statement is synthetic. On the other hand, um, all bachelors are unmarried, is true, simply in virtue of the definition of bachelor. Bachelor is defined as unmarried man. So it's not possible for all bachelors are unmarried to be false. We don't need to examine the world to see if it's true. Uh, this statement is analytic. It's just a matter of definition. So um, true analytic statements are fine, um, but they don't say anything about the world. They don't give us any factual knowledge. They're just a matter of definitions, conventions. What about empirically verifiable? My well, statement is empirically verifiable, just in case there is some set of observations that would show it to be true. With it is raining, we know what observations would show this to be true. If we walk outside and see and feel droplets of water falling from the sky, we know that it is raining is true. So the verification principle says that a statement, uh, if a statement is not true by definition, and we cannot say what observations would show it to be true, then it's meaningless. The basic idea here uh, was that um, synthetic statements make claims about the world, and the only access we have to the world is through our experience. So if we can't say what difference it would make to our experience if a statement is true or false, um, it's, it's not really making claims about the world at all, so it's meaningless. Uh, and the logical positivists try to use the verification principle to show that basically all of you know, religions, spirituality, uh, metaphysics, huge chunks of philosophy, um, and so on, were just meaningless. Um, they were strictly concerned about observation and empirical science. So anyway, that's the basic verification principle. There's a bit more to it than that, actually. If you're interested, I have a video on verificationism which goes into a bit more detail. But for our purpose, um, we can say that a statement is meaningful just in case it's analytic or empirically verifiable. So the question for us is, what does this mean for moral statements? Well, you should have some idea if you recall the last video uh, when I discussed the is ought gap and the fact value distinction. We can't derive moral claims from descriptive claims, and it seems that moral values are something very different from facts. Consider a, a moral claim it was wrong to shoplift that DVD. Obviously, this isn't analytic, uh, it's not true in virtue of, of the meaning of, you know shoplift and wrong and so on, that it's wrong to shoplift a DVD, um, and actually we can, we can probably all come up with some unusual complicated scenario in which shoplifting DVDs is perfectly okay. Um, so it's not analytic, but neither, given the is ought gap and the fact value distinction, does it seem to be possible to empirically verify it. Ask yourself, what sort of observations could we make to show that this is true or false? Observations of the world don't seem to bear on the question of value. As we noted in the last video, it seems that two people could agree completely on all the facts about shoplifting, but still make different moral judgments about it. So, it follows that moral judgments are simply meaningless. 
They do not say anything about the world. They do not describe the world. They are not capable of being true or false. Um, according to Ayer, moral statements are simply expressions of emotion. So it was wrong to shoplift that DVD. doesn't say anything more than you shoplifted that DVD. It was wrong to shoplift that DVD and it was right to shoplift that DVD both make exactly the same statement, namely, you shoplifted that DVD. Adding that an action is right or wrong does nothing more than express a particular kind of emotion about that action. It's like saying, you shoplifted that DVD in a disapproving tone of voice. So saying it was wrong to shoplift that DVD is like saying, you, you shoplifted that DVD, ooh, <laughs> yeah, some, something like that. Um, Generalising then, shoplifting is wrong expresses nothing more than shoplifting, boo. And this is the case for all other moral judgments. Emotivism is uh, sometimes called the yay boo theory. X is good or right just means X yay, X is bad or wrong just means X boo. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Strictly speaking, these, these moral claims are meaningless. Um, or rather, Aya says that they, they express emotive meaning, um, but they don't have any literal meaning. They can't be true or false. They're like saying, ouch, or, oh, God, what a day, you know, some, something like that. They're just expressions of emotion. Um, okay, now, it's important to bear in mind the distinction between expressing an emotion and describing an emotion. I mentioned this in the last video, but it's important, so I'll reiterate it. Suppose you feel happy. You may look glum, but you can describe your feeling by saying, I feel happy. On the other hand, uh, you may feel happy and you may say nothing, but you can express your feeling by smiling. So, so for emotivists, moral judgments are expressions, expressions of emotion. When I say that murder disgusts me, or I disapprove of murder, I'm simply dis I'm describing my attitude to murder, and what I say can be true or false, because I could be lying. But if I say murder is wrong, I'm merely expressing my attitude, and the, the question of truth or falsity simply doesn't arise. Now, obviously, I might be lying in a sense, because um, I might be trying to uh, mislead as to my real feelings, just as somebody who's feeling sad can pretend to be happy by smiling. But clearly, a smile can't be true or false, uh, and so it is with moral judgments. Moral judgments can't be true or false, though they can be misleading. Perhaps you feel that murder is wonderful, but you're not saying anything false when you say murder is wrong. You're just expressing an attitude. Okay, um, verificationism was once very popular, um, but it had all sorts of problems. Uh, most philosophers today reject it. I mean, the, the very, very few people, very few philosophers are sort of um, kind of strict verificationists, strict logical positivists in the sense that um, Ayer was. Um, however, you don't need to be a verificationist to be an emotivist. One of the most important figures in emotivism was uh, C.L. Stevenson, who, as far as I know, wasn't a verificationist. Um, obviously, if we reject verificationism, then we need to find some other argument for the thesis that moral statements are merely expressions of emotion. And Stevenson has a few arguments. I'll look at what I think are the two strongest. So first of all, he appeals to the nature of moral discussion. Uh, basically, his claim is that our attitudes have a, a very important central role in moral discussion. Attitudes determine which beliefs are relevant, and attitudes determine when the discussion is resolved. So, the point that attitudes determine which beliefs are relevant. Consider the example of um, two people debating abortion. The pro-choicer has argued that women have the right to abortions because people have the right to do what they want with their own bodies. Um, and he actually agrees that the fetus has a right to life, but he regards this as irrelevant because he says that our right to bodily autonomy our right to decide what to do with our own bodies, trumps the fetus's right to life. So maybe he appeals to something like um, Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist example. I don't know if you're aware of this, it's a famous thought experiment. Thompson says, imagine you wake up one day to find you've been hooked up to a, a famous violinist. The violinist has some kidney disorder and uh, he's been connected to you so that he can make use of your kidneys. And he's going to need to stay there for nine months. If you unplug yourself before the nine months is, uh, is over, he'll die. Um, now, Thompson's point is, we probably all agree that the violinist has a right to life, but this doesn't give him the right to use your body. Um, I think many of us would say that even though the violinist has a right to life, you do have the right to unplug yourself. 
even if it would lead to his death. So, so suppose that the pro-choicer puts forward that argument. Now imagine that the pro-lifer responds by saying, well, killing the fetus is wrong because uh, the fetus has a heartbeat, has a functioning brain, it may even be conscious, and it's wrong to kill conscious human beings. And the pro-lifer may have all sorts of evidence to support what he's saying. Um, it is in fact true that the fetus has a functioning brain, certainly towards the end of pregnancy. But notice that all of this is completely irrelevant. The pro-choicer's support of abortion rests on his view that the woman's right to bodily autonomy trumps whatever rights the fetus may have. Uh, and obviously the pro-life has simply failed to address this. So the point that Stevenson would make is that in moral discussions it's our attitudes which determine uh, uh, which facts are relevant to the discussion. If your opponent is granting that the fetus has a right to life, and resting his arguments on the right to bodily autonomy, then facts about the fetus are irrelevant. Um, okay, so that's, that's the first point. Attitudes determine what beliefs are relevant. So, second, notice that once our debaters have the same attitude towards the issue, so they both agree that abortion is wrong, or they both agree that abortion is acceptable, then the discussion is resolved. They may still disagree on various facts, Perhaps they still disagree on whether the fetus is conscious, but if they both have the same attitude, supporting or, or opposing abortion, there's no longer any moral discussion to be had. So what all of this comes down to then is that our attitudes have a central role in moral debates. Stevenson's um, most important argument is based on moral motivation. Uh, I don't think Stevenson himself really developed this argument very much, but it, it's become... Uh, an important argument for non-cognitivism, so I'll, I'll try to present it in its strongest form. Um, so first of all, we have what's known as the Humean account of motivation, uh, because it supposedly goes back to David Hume, uh, and this draws a strict distinction between beliefs and desires, and it says that beliefs in themselves can never motivate us to do anything. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are, how many beliefs you've got, uh, the beliefs alone will never motivate you to action. Suppose I find that a large fire has started in my house, so I come to believe uh, that, that there's a large fire in my house. I also believe that fire kills, um, so we might say that given this, are we motivated to leave the house? But of course that isn't true. I'll only be motivated to leave the house if I also desire to stay alive. If I genuinely couldn't care less whether I live or die, and I, I, I couldn't care about you know, experiencing the pain of burning or the discomfort of inhaling smoke, then I'll just stay sitting there and let the fire consume me. Uh, so it seems that in all cases in which we're motivated to action, some sort of desire is involved. There's something that we want. Hume's um, lovely phrase is, reason is the slave of the passions. Reason tells us what the facts are, that's our beliefs, uh, but only our passions, our desires, can move us. So the second part of the argument is that moral judgments necessarily motivate us. If I hold that giving to charity is morally good, then I'm motivated to at least some degree to give to charity. I have a reason to give to charity. Uh, if I believe that abortion is morally bad, I'm motivated to refrain from abortion. Obviously, this motivation is not absolute. People can have other motivations. People can be uh, weak-willed. Um, so I might also want to live in a, a big house, which will motivate me to save up all of my money, and then I, I won't give to charity. But the motivation to give to charity is still there. Uh, just consider your own moral judgments. Even if you fail to be perfectly moral, isn't it the case that your moral judgments, you know, they, they do move you, they do give you a reason for acting in certain ways, even if other reasons ultimately triumph. So to state it simply, uh, beliefs in themselves never motivate us. Moral judgments necessarily motivate us. It follows that moral judgments are not beliefs. This is a very popular argument, and I'll uh, probably look at it in more detail in later videos. Um, but, but that's the, uh, the basic sort of structure of the argument from, from moral motivation. There's a related point here which leads to the same conclusion. If we hold that moral judgments are beliefs, then we can combine any set of moral judgments with any set of attitudes. So somebody could say, abortion is wrong, but I completely approve of abortion. Slavery is wrong, but I completely approve of slavery. Giving to charity is good, but I disapprove of giving to charity and so on for any moral claim. But this just seems bizarre. If you say things like this, I think we'd wonder if you really understand the meaning of what you're saying. So, so this gives us some grounds, uh, again, for supposing that moral judgments are expressions of attitudes, not beliefs. Um, again, though, we'll examine all of this uh, a bit more later.
Uh, okay, so let's think about some of the problems with emotivism. Uh, it's worth bearing these problems in mind as we go through the series because uh, emotivism isn't really accepted anymore and the non-cognitivist views which came later were developed in response to some of these problems. Um, so an immediate objection that many people have is that emotivism is unacceptable because it destroys the ideas of moral truth, moral objectivity, moral progress and so on. Uh, it makes morality a matter of opinion, basically. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we don't want to say that. Um, many people want to say, you know, it's, uh, it's just false. It's just incorrect to claim that slavery is acceptable. Slavery is wrong. Uh, treating people as chattel, causing such massive human suffering, depriving innocent people of liberty, that's just wrong. Um, and we want to say that in outlawing slavery we've made real progress. But the emotivist denies this. Um, no moral judgment is false. And banning slavery isn't an example of moral uh, of progress, it's just that people's attitudes are different now to what they were. It's just, it's just change, it's not, um, it's not change in, any, you know, in a good or bad direction. So emotivism uh, takes the force out of morality. It makes it nothing more than, uh, well, nothing more than people's feelings, basically. Uh, intuitions, of course, differ on whether this is actually a problem. Um, personally, I consider this to be a benefit of emotivism. Uh, it's always seemed to me that morality is basically just a matter of opinion or feelings. Um, for as long as I can remember, it seemed obvious to me that moral values aren't objective. They're, they're in us. They're not out there. I've never been a realist. So this objection has absolutely no force whatsoever for me. Um, you know, I, I think that we have to we have to actually look at the um, I don't know the arguments. You can't just assume that uh, morality is true and objective and so on, um, because of course that's kind of begging the question, isn't it? Um, so I, I don't think this is really a very persuasive argument. Um, okay. Second, one of the surprising consequences of emotivism is that there are no real moral disagreements. Suppose two people observe an action, say two men kissing. One observer smiles because she thinks it's sweet. The other has a look of disgust because he doesn't like gay men. Now, his look of disgust doesn't contradict her smile. They're just different reactions. They're evincing different feelings. So similarly, according to the emotivist, um, if she says it's okay to be gay and he says it's wrong to be gay, all they're doing is evincing different feelings. They're not making any statements about anything that can be contradicted. Um, so if homosexuality is wrong, if that statement just expresses a feeling, it's not fundamentally different to you know, a look of disgust at homosexuality. Uh, and in what sense can I um, deny or disagree with that? All I can do in response to that is evince different feelings, and that's all. But this is very curious, because we certainly do seem to have substantial moral disagreements. We seem to engage in plenty of moral debates. Um, now, Ayer uh, himself didn't regard this as much of a problem. Ayer points out that what seem like moral disagreements usually turn out to be disagreements of facts. Uh, I gave an example of this in the last video. Two people are debating abortion. One of them is an extreme pro-life who says abortion is always wrong because the fetus has a functioning brain. The extreme pro-choicer says abortion is always permissible because the fetus does not have a functioning brain. Obviously, this is a disagreement about facts. They both agree that what's morally important is having a functioning brain. So there's no disagreement about values here. Uh, and in fact, of course, both of them are wrong. I think the earliest brain activity occurs around 12 weeks, and by 24 weeks, the brain is pretty much fully formed. Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a very simplistic example. But if you consider many moral debates, such as you know, drug legalization, treatment of the environment, free speech, all that stuff, it, it often does rest on a disagreement about facts. Somebody supports free speech because they think it has certain beneficial consequences. Somebody else says it needs to be limited because it has such and such uh, deleterious consequences. And very often we find that they actually share the same values. And the disagreement concerns um, the, the factual matter of how best to realise those values, you know, how, how best to realise a sort of stable society, open society, tolerant society, you know, should we tolerate intolerance? Um, that kind of question seems to be more a, a disagreement about facts. But this doesn't, you know, this doesn't seem completely satisfactory because, you know, surely there are plenty of cases where we do disagree about value. 
Again, with the example of abortion, it may be that the pro-lifer thinks that the right to life trumps everything else, while the pro-choicer believes that the woman's right to bodily autonomy trumps everything else. In this case, we have two people holding very different values. Um, but nevertheless, it seems like they have a, a real disagreement and could, could engage in a significant debate. Now, don't we often disagree and debate values? Well, one option here is just to widen the notion of disagreement. This was Stevenson's approach. He said, well, you know, look, there are different kinds of disagreement. There are disagreements in belief and there are disagreements in attitude. So if I desire to play free jazz music and you desire that I don't because you find free jazz to be awful noise, then it's quite natural to say that we disagree about what should be done. Um, you know, and, and that's true, but I think that this misses the point of the objection. Uh, the problem for emotivism is that disagreements about moral value seem like disagreements in beliefs, and emotivism denies this. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you say Frank Zappa was a chemist, and I say Frank Zappa was not a chemist, then I'm contradicting you. I'm, I'm denying what you've said. But if you say homosexuality is wrong, and I say homosexuality is not wrong, then according to the emotivist, I'm not contradicting you. I'm not denying what you've said. We ju we're just expressing different feelings. Um, and this does seem, you know, a bit odd. Uh, consider, again, the example where I want to put on a free jazz record and you don't want me to. Well, it's natural to call that a disagreement, but it's obvious that we're not contradicting each other. Because if I say I want to play some free jazz, it would be utterly bizarre to respond, no, that's not true, or you're wrong. But with homosexuality is wrong, that's not true, or you're wrong, seems a perfectly natural response. Uh, so, so this is what emotivism can't account for, and simply widening the notion of disagreement doesn't really help here. Um, but I suppose, again, you know, uh, intuitions may differ on this point. Right, let's consider some more serious problems. So, you may be wondering, OK, moral judgments express emotions, but why shouldn't they also express beliefs? Language is a very powerful and pliable tool. We can do many things with it. Consider the statement... I'm going to ace this exam. This clearly expresses an emotion. It expresses confidence. It expresses composure in the face of the test. But it also expresses a belief, namely that I'm going to get a high score on the exam. So why shouldn't moral statements be like this? Well, we've seen that Ayer has a reason to reject that moral statements express beliefs. Uh, this rests on his verificationism. But if we consider Stevenson's arguments, it's not obvious that moral judgments shouldn't also express beliefs. Uh, emotivists need to show not just that moral judgments express emotions, but that they only express emotions, uh, or that the expression of emotion is somehow primary. Um, so, so emotivism needs to deploy arguments against cognitivism. Um, and we'll look at those arguments later in the series. I'm not going to look at them now. Uh, but I just wanted to flag up that the emotivist, I think, will need to appeal to some of these arguments. Without those arguments, it's, it's just left hanging with no support. Right. Emotivists say that moral judgments are expressions of emotion. So, which emotions are these exactly? Um, Miller points out in his introduction to contemporary metaethics, there are really only two options here, and neither of them seem to work. First, we could say that we have some sort of unique, special, distinctively moral emotion, which can't be reduced to or analysed in terms of other emotions, or we could say that moral emotions uh, do reduce to non-moral emotions. So, so moral emotions just are uh, certain kinds of non-moral emotions. So let's consider the first option, that we have some special, irreducible, unanalyzable moral emotion. One obvious problem here is that this seems to be falsified by our own experiences. Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but, but I, I don't know if I actually do have any such emotion. I mean, uh, you know, sadness, yep, anger, fine. Uh, shame, boredom, joy, fear, disgust, I, you know, I, they, they seem pretty clear to me. Uh, I know what they feel like. Uh, the moral emotion, I don't really know what that is. Um, so, immediate problem right there. But second, uh, Miller has, I think, a fairly decisive argument against this proposal. Uh, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little, but this is basically what he says. He says, if we say that moral judgments express irreducible, unanalyzable moral emotions, then we can't explain moral judgment in terms of emotion. What are moral judgments? Those which express moral emotions. 
What are moral emotions? Those expressed by moral judgments. So, the first option makes emotivism circular. It makes it completely empty. It, it has these crucial phrases, moral judgment and moral emotions, but it doesn't explain either of them because each is defined directly in terms of the other. You know, so so we, we have no idea what these really mean. Okay, so this first option just doesn't it just doesn't seem that this is going to work. All right, so let's think about the second option. Um, so suppose moral judgments, uh, moral emotions, reduce to non-moral emotions. Okay, there are there are two ways that this could work. Um, first, perhaps there's one particular emotion which is the moral emotion. You know, there's one single moral emotion, um, empathy, for example. Uh, I think this is obviously false. You, you know, uh, 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 abortion is wrong. That judgment, that may be based on empathy for the fetus, uh, it may be based on a general disgust towards killing, it may be based on a, a sense of duty towards God plus the view that God disapproves of abortion, it may be based on any, any number of things. So, so moral, moral, there can't be just one non-moral emotion which is, the, uh, which is the one that moral emotions reduce to. Um, so moral emotions must reduce to sets of non-moral emotions. Uh, just taking those three candidates I mentioned, we might say that the set contains uh, disgust, empathy, sense of duty towards God, or whatever. Um, okay, so consider something like torturing a terrorist to reveal the location of a bomb. Well, we might then feel a sense of empathy towards the person being tortured, but we might also feel that God sanctions torture just in case it's likely uh, to reveal important information. So what's our moral judgment now? Well, then we seem to have torture is wrong yeah, from empathy, from the empathy for the person being tortured, and torture is not wrong from you know our, our connection to God and belief that he sanctions torture in this kind of circumstance. Um, so, so we seem to have, this seems to lead to contradictory beliefs, uh, uh, contradictory judgments. Obviously, a motivist wouldn't say belief. Um, but it seems to lead to contradictory judgments. I mean, indeed, actually, this can happen with a single emotion. So um, we might feel a sense of empathy both with the person being tortured and with all the people who could be saved by the information he might reveal. Uh, again, this gives the judgment that torture is wrong and that torture is not wrong. I mean, this point really relates to a, a broader problem, which is that when exactly is a non-moral emotion to count as a moral emotion? I mean, in fact, obviously, uh, we very rarely issue judgments that are plainly contradictory. When we feel empathy both with the person being tortured and with the people who could be saved, we don't say torture is wrong and torture is not wrong. Rather, one of these instances of empathy is a moral emotion and one isn't. So what determines when empathy counts as a moral emotion? I mean, the same problem occurs with all the other candidate moral emotions. Take disgust. A person's disgust towards homosexuality may underlie their judgment that homosexuality is wrong, but disgust towards celery never leads anyone to say that eating celery is wrong. So this is a really serious problem. Um, if we're going to say that moral judgments are expressions of emotion, you know, we, we need some sort of explanation of uh, what emotions these might be. Um, you know, if sometimes the same emotion can be a moral emotion and sometimes it isn't a moral emotion, we need some explanation of you know, what's, what's the difference here? What accounts for this? And uh, this hasn't really been explained. So, big problem there. Isn't it possible to make moral judgments without any corresponding emotions of approval or disapproval? Consider a psychopath who says, yes, I know that murder is wrong, but I don't care. I enjoy murdering and I don't care if something's morally wrong. Uh, it seems that people can say that something is morally wrong without having any attitude of disapproval towards it. But in that case, moral judgments can't simply be expressions of emotion. And notice that this is a direct attack not just on emotivism itself, but also on the argument for moral motivation that we saw earlier. If you can make moral judgments without any corresponding emotions, then you can make moral judgments without being motivated to act on them. Um, one possible response here is to insist that actually the psychopath isn't making any moral judgments at all. Uh, instead, he's expressing his beliefs about social conventions, about the values that most people have. So when he says, I know that murder is wrong, really he's just referring to the fact that society holds that murder is wrong. Um, it's important to note that emotivists will accept that language can be used in many different ways. 
The sentence, murder is wrong, could be used to mean pretty much anything. If you were to say it in a sarcastic way, like, you know, yeah, sure, murder is wrong, whatever, I mean, I, something like that, it, it might be used to express that murder is right, okay? So, I emotivism, and this is the case for pretty much any meta-ethical view, is only talking about the standard, standard usage of moral statements. And it does seem reasonable to say that a psychopath might not be using moral statements in the standard way. Um, the emotivist would just say, well, since the psychopath uh, apparently doesn't have moral emotions, he can't be expressing them. So he, he's just using language differently. So maybe, maybe that works. The Frege-Geech problem was uh, first stated in the late 50s by Peter Geech. Uh, Gottlob Frege was an important logician who was dead before emotivism was even proposed, um, but Geech's statement of the problem was inspired by Frege, so it's called the Frege-Geech problem. Uh, this is a problem for any non-cognitivist. In fact, a great deal of the work in non-cognitivism since the late 50s has basically been an attempt to respond to this problem, um, and I think it's fair to say that so far it remains heavily debated whether any of these responses actually work. So this is a really, really big problem. It's one of the main issues in meta-ethics. So, um, you know, if you get anything from, from this video, make sure that you, you know, you get this, because this is, this is the really important one. To, t to, to state it plainly, what this problem comes down to is that if emotivism is correct, then the meaning of moral statements changes in unasserted contexts. But when we think about moral language, it seems obvious that the meaning of moral statements does not change in unasserted contexts. So emotivism must be false. Okay, let's, uh, let's think about this. Suppose I assert murder is wrong. The emotivist says that this expresses disapproval of murder. Fair enough. But now think about these. If murder is wrong, then paying somebody to murder is wrong. Cecil says that murder is wrong. We had to discuss whether murder is wrong. Now, when I use the words murder is wrong in these larger statements, I'm not expressing my disapproval of murder. I mean, I may well disapprove of murder, but obviously I'm not expressing it when I say Cecil says that murder is wrong. I could just as well say Cecil says that murder is acceptable. In statements of the form Cecil says that, uh, I'm not expressing any of my emotions. I'm describing what Cecil says. Uh, again, we had to discuss whether murder is wrong. This is just a description. There's no emotion being expressed here. It follows that the meaning of murder is wrong varies depending on whether it's straightforwardly asserted, as in, murder is wrong, or embedded into a larger statement, like Cecil says that murder is wrong. In fact, it's not just that its meaning changes, it loses its meaning altogether. Remember, the emotivist says that murder is wrong has only emotive meaning. Literally, it's meaningless. In unasserted contexts, murder is wrong loses its emotive meaning. So in those contexts, it doesn't really express anything at all. This is deeply bizarre. And notice what this entails about the meaning of the statements it's embedded in. If you think about the statement, um, we had to discuss whether Blurzel blocks Flibbity Zipper. This is obvious nonsense. Blurzel blocks Flibbity Zipper is just noise. So we had to discuss whether Blurzel blocks Flibbity Zipper uh, isn't even grammatical. I mean, it's, it's, it's not meaningless at all. Uh, it's not meaningful at all. But remember that murder is wrong, literally speaking, has no more meaning than Blurzel blocks Flibbity Zipper. Uh, nor does it have emotive meaning in unasserted contexts. So when you say, we had to discuss whether murder is wrong, you might as well have said, we had to discuss whether blurs or blocks flippity zipper. These statements express exactly the same thing, namely nothing. But this is ridiculous, because we had to discuss whether murder is wrong is obviously meaningful. It clearly expresses something, and in fact, we all understand what it expresses. We all know what would make that sentence true, and what would make it false. It's ridiculous to say that, 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 that we had to discuss whether murder is wrong uh, is you know, of the same kind as we had to discuss whether blurs or blocks flippity zipper. But it seems that the emotivist is, is forced to say this. Uh, now I suppose we might argue, maybe you might say, well, in unasserted contexts, murder is wrong somehow gains literal meaning. Uh, it loses emotive meaning, but it somehow gains literal meaning. Um, the problem with this is that if we grant that murder is wrong can have literal meaning, how do we resist problem number three? That is, how do we resist the conclusion that moral statements have both emotive and literal meaning, express both emotions and beliefs? You know, we, we need some, some explanation for that. And in any case, even if, you know, we accept that, even if we go for this kind of solution, it still entails that the meaning of murder is wrong changes 
depending on whether it's asserted or unasserted. If it's asserted, it has emotive meaning. If it's unasserted, it has literal meaning. So the meaning, the meaning still changes. And this is the core of the frege geach problem. We can see the force of this problem uh, if we consider moral arguments. So take, if murder is wrong, then paying somebody to murder is wrong. Murder is wrong, therefore paying somebody to murder is wrong. This looks like a perfectly reasonable argument. But murder is wrong, and paying somebody to murder is wrong, these moral judgments, are asserted at times and unasserted at others. So the meanings of these parts of this argument are not the same throughout, which means it's a straightforward fallacy of equivocation. It's, it's just like the argument, the gambler's whim was a fluke, the fluke is a species of flatfish, the gambler's whim was a species of flatfish. This argument is obviously idiotic because it equivocates on the word fluke, um, but emotivism entails that this argument about murder is no better. And this is going to be a problem for any moral argument that we make. So even if emotivists can show that murder is wrong doesn't lose all meaning in an asserted context, even if they can somehow show that it, it you know, gains, me gains literal meaning when it's unasserted, it still looks like its meaning completely changes in unasserted contexts. And this destroys the possibility of moral reasoning. Okay, it's, it's the problem that when I, when I assert murder is wrong, I'm expressing my emotions. But when I use the phrase murder is wrong in a statement like, you know, we had to discuss whether murder is wrong, I'm not expressing my emotions. That's the core of the frege Geach problem. Okay, it causes all these, these issues for, for arguments. And these kinds of absurdities are multiplied in, in all sorts of situations. Um, Andrew Fisher, in his introduction to Metaethics, gives the example of questions. Uh, I ask you, do you think that murder is wrong? And you respond, of course murder is wrong. And this looks like a perfectly reasonable exchange, but the emotivist is forced to say that you've simply failed to answer my question. Murder is wrong is unasserted in the question and asserted in the answer, so its meaning is completely different in each. You might as well have answered, of course water is wet. What this comes down to is that the very possibility of much of our discourse hinges on the fact that statements retain their meaning whether they're asserted or unasserted, and emotivism denies this. So this is a really big problem. Very closely related to the frege geach problem is Jorgensen's dilemma. Uh, in fact, they're often conflated, but they're not quite the same thing. Consider again the argument, you know, if murder is wrong, paying somebody to murder is wrong, etc. Uh, as I said, this, this looks like a valid argument. It's, um, it's modus ponens. It's of the form if p then q, p therefore q. This is a valid form. Uh, it seems that if somebody accepts the premises, then they are rationally forced to accept the conclusion. But remember, for the emotivist, moral statements are neither true nor false. Now, the problem here is that logical validity is defined in terms of truth preservation. We say that a conclusion follows from its premises just in case the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. That's what validity is. A valid argument is one in which if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true too. But notice that with this argument, if the emotivist is right, the premises and the conclusion can't be true or false. They're not they're not candidates for truth or falsity. You know, on emotivism, um, premise two here, murder is wrong, is just like saying, you know, ouch, or, oh, God, what a day. I mean, they're not even candidates for truth or falsity. So, so the, 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 the frege Geach problem is that if emotivism is true, then the meaning of moral ch statements changes in unasserted contexts. Um, and one of the problems with this is that it prevents moral arguments from being valid. But even if we can get around this, even if we can show that the meaning of moral statements is preserved in unasserted contexts, then we still have the problem that moral statements can't be true or false, which seems to render it impossible to make logical inferences between them. So even if we could show that murder is wrong means the same thing throughout this argument, it's still the case that murder is wrong can't be true or false. So it makes no sense to say that the truth of these premises would guarantee the truth of the conclusion. We, we can't talk about truth here. This seems to leave us with two options. Either we f try to find a way to widen the notion of validity so that it doesn't depend on truth, or we bite the bullet and hold that moral arguments are never valid. Moral inferences are never rational, never logical. But this seems ridiculous. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure we'd all say that if you accept these premises, then you rationally have to accept the conclusion. Uh, anyway, just 
keep in mind the distinction between um, the Frege Geach problem and Jorgensen's dilemma. Even if we solve the Frege Geach problem, this doesn't necessarily mean we've solved Jorgensen's dilemma. Uh, and of course, one of the one response to these problems, I suppose, you know, you could um, you could bite the bullet with both of them and say, you know, yep, the meaning of moral statements changes depending on whether they're asserted or not. You know, moral inference is never rational. Um, you know, if I ask you questions like, do you think murder is wrong and you answer, then you haven't really answered them and, and all this. You, I suppose you could do that. It's not a very popular response. I'm not aware of any philosophers who make it, but I, I guess it's an option. The more standard response is to try to preserve the basic ideas of emotivism, you know, preserve the idea that moral statements don't express beliefs and can't be true or false, but then try to interpret them in such a way that the frege Geach problem and Jorgensen's dilemma uh, don't arise. And that's pretty much what all the work in non-cognitivism since the 1950s has been about. So we'll look at that in some later videos. But uh, not today, because we've been through enough. So thanks for watching, and goodbye.